my English teacher friends, Christian Kuhn coming at you again, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of Composition. And I have a super cool writing workshop for you all today. I got coaxed into seeing the Barbie movie with my daughter, and man, oh man, am I glad I went to go see that movie with her. I got a slew of lesson plans, and one of them I'm going to share in this video. Gloria's monologue is just rife with possibilities to teach rhetorical analysis. So what I'm going to do in this video is walk teachers and students through the process of constructing a rhetorical analysis essay from start to finish. So we'll take a look at my templates for my introductory paragraphs, my templates or heuristics for the body paragraph, and then we'll get into sentence stems. So strap in, sit tight, I'll walk you through the whole thing. So. In my YouTube channel, you'll see that in the description of this video, there's a link to the actual text. So you can have a hard copy of that. But it's also really cool to have students see the monologue, you know, live in action. YouTube has a number of clips, so you can just go on there and check it out so the kids can hear it, but they also can read it. Please subscribe to my channel. It's growing, and I'm hoping by the time the end of the year comes, I will have 15,000 subscribers. So that's kind of the goal of the channel. So before we dive in, one of the things that I'm known to say is this. It's kind of like my adage. I'm always peddling this question. What if we taught composition like Bob Ross teaches painting? And I'm known to say, you got to Bob Ross your instruction. Here's what I mean by that. Bob Ross always painted with his students, and he did so with the use of templates. He called it a heuristic, and it's known as the wet-on-wet -wet technique. And when I work with teachers, I always encourage them to be the expert writer in the classroom and to quote-unquote paint with their students with the use of templates or heuristics. And I always do this with kids. If I'm going to show them how to write this paper, I really need to write it myself in order to demystify it and, and, and shore up all the loose ends and, and really unravel it because rhetorical analysis is a whole other beast and kids really need to see that modeled for them quite a few times before they're independent and on their own. So let's start with our first question, right? We assign this paper to our students and they're going to ask themselves, so how do I write the introductory paragraph? And before I answer that question, I want to teach you guys a hack or a cheat code. If you go back and look at decades worth of rhetorical analysis prompts that the College Board has put out, implicit in those prompts are two questions. What is the authorial intent and how does the author construct meaning? If a student answers both of those questions satisfactorily, meaning they've read, they've ascertained the meaning of the text accurately, if they answer both of those questions, they're pretty much guaranteeing themselves the thesis point. So here's what I tell my students, though, in terms of performing rhetorical analysis. Typically, you have two choices for an introductory paragraph. You can declare the thesis or you can invert the thesis. But for rhetorical analysis, boom, let's keep it easy. Let's just declare. So let me break down what I mean by that. When you declare the thesis, you begin with the thesis. And in this case, the thesis is going to answer the question, how does the author construct meaning? Whenever you answer that question, whether it be literary analysis or rhetorical analysis, how, how does the author construct meaning? That's the thesis. That's going to take three sentences. So you sprinkle in a little bit of context and background, heavy focus on the construction of meaning. Students need to sprinkle in some tier two level vocabulary. And what I mean by that is your average run of the mill SAT level caliber words. I run intensive word study academies throughout the academic year. So my students you know, they really grow exponentially over the course of the year. Their vocabs take off, really augment uh, with a concentrated vocab study, word study academy. And then the other thing that I want them to focus on are their sentence constructs. Many of you know that I saddle my students with the seminal text by Strunk and White called Write It Right. 
and they have something called rule number 18, which purports that there's 12 different ways to cobble together a different sentence. So in order to achieve the voice rhythm flow to get that elusive sophistication point, I really have my students focus on their sentence constructs and uh, wield a variety of different sentence constructs with purpose and effect. And then always, 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 my introductory paragraphs are four sentences long. So let's break that down. It's three plus one, three sentences, how does the author construct meaning? One sentence, what is the authorial intent? Now, another thing that I have my students do during the reading process is go hunting for terms, devices, and techniques. So in my classroom, I have an easel and it's all Velcro and laminate. And every time we discover a new term, device, technique, we add it to our easel. And what kids do as they read, they remove the placards and put them on the whiteboard. So in Gloria's monologue, there's a number of things that are you know, really manifest in it that if the kid's going to ascertain the meaning and get the right answer, they have to identify certain rhetorical pieces. So as a class, you know, given that we're doing this early in the academic year, I help them with their reads to make sure that they're seeing everything that they need to see because uh, there is some trickeration to this even though it's a mere Barbie monologue. So let's take a look at sample number one and see how this three plus one paradigm works. So again, I'm gonna focus three sentences on the construction of meaning. So you're gonna to wanna to hear you know, terms, devices, techniques in those three sentences. And then one sentence about authorial intent for a total of four sentences. So look how this goes. With the heavy focus on the all-encompassing you pronoun, Gloria delineates the shared plight of every woman seeking the elusive it of womanhood. The negating conjunctions highlight the futility of the battle. While women try to fit into certain societal modes, somehow and in some way they get canceled by the flip side of the coin. The struggle is endless and ceaselessly painstaking, which is reflected through the litany of concrete examples. As ironic as it may appear, the predicament is even shared with a doll who represents the epitome of feminine beauty. So as you can see here, if we break this down, ultimately I tell my students focus on the three, typically it's three, three salient terms, devices, techniques in the piece. So you can see in this exemplar here, you know, the you pronoun is very important as are the conjunctions that the but in the, in the monologue negates everything. And then the, it's heavy on irony. So those are the three that uh, are isolated here. Uh, notice that there's a good deal of tier two level vocabulary in this. Uh, all encompassing, delineated, plight. So the vocab's up, really nice. Uh, all the sentence constructs are varied. And one little t tip, uh, a piece of advice tip that I give kids is don't parallel your syntax unless you absolutely, absolutely have a reason to. But typically in the introduction, you're not paralleling your syntax. So I just say, be mindful. If you just dropped an independent clause, don't drop another one. Otherwise, you're going to get a very droning rhythm in your uh, voice rhythm and flow. So be very cognizant of the sentences you're dropping and stagger them, vary them. So that might be complicated. So let's paint another one and do it all over again. So here is exemplar number two. Same thing, we're gonna do three plus one. As ironic as it may sound, not even Barbie, a doll who is the poster child for femininity, can satisfy the absurd social expectations of being an ideal woman. In juxtaposing idealism with stark social realities, Gloria delineates the hypocrisy through the frequent employment of negating conjunctions. Further, the elusive it that all women seek is frustratingly unattainable. No matter how much a woman tries to be a social representation of ideal womanhood, she is certain to fail. So again, up top, you got irony, juxtaposition, conjunctions, right? Those are three of the key features, rhetorical features of this piece. You place them in there, that last sentence gets to the authorial intent. So as always, three plus one. 
So kids might be looking at this and saying, I can't do this. This is too hard. It takes practice and your teacher's got to Bob Ross it for you a few times. So yes, you can. You absolutely can do this. I'll show you one last crack at it just to really shore up how to do it. So exemplar number three is going to follow that three plus one paradigm as well. So look at this. Gloria elucidates the strange irony of women aspiring to be a woman. It quite simply is an unattainable and futile pursuit. Through a long litany and negating conjunctions, she points out what the feminine ideal looks like. But once a woman approximates these traits, she is deemed as being snooty, pretentious, and the like. This it that women collectively seek is a confounding mirage. And the thing is this. Not even a doll who is the face of feminine beauty can lasso this thing that all women struggle to find and pin down. So one of the things that I want to talk about very early in the academic year with my students, and at the time of recording this, the, the movie just came out. We're, we're you know in July. I don't go back to school in September, but this is going to be the first rhetorical piece that I do. I really want to focus on sophistication with my students, the, you know, set, set them up to get the sophistication point as elusive and, and as a pain in the neck that sophistication point is and it, it you know irritates a lot of AP teachers i think one key feature to sophistication is not being over pedantic and you can see in my exemplars here i say things like lasso and pin down so you can be hip you can be cool you can be your 17 year old self and use a tad bit of colloquial and vernacular with the academic i really think sophisticated writers do that so i'm going to model that for my students in this particular essay and uh, i'm pretty pretty certain that that's key to sophistication so i know my sophisticated writers in my 22 plus years of teaching do a nice teeter-totter balance between the colloquial, the vernacular, and the tier two. So if you are writing along with me, this is a good time to pause and have your students write their introductions and uh, have them share their writing with each other. I'm a big believer that the more writing students see, the better they become. And maybe you could do a little writing workshop just on introductions. So once the intros are done, we're left with the following question. So, how do I write the body paragraphs? And as always, those that are familiar with my work, you know I'm going to say this, proceed with the syllogistic method. And I'm going to go through the syllogistic method relatively quickly because in my YouTube channel, I have other videos that go over it in more detail. So I'm just going to give a cursory glance over this. The syllogistic method is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum, and the town's boys would go there to learn about oration, polemics, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling, and they'd often throw out these, you know, juicy essential questions like, what is justice? And maybe somewhere along the line, you read Plato's Republic, and the, the whole text centers around what is justice. So these phil philosophical think tankers and scholars would step to the proverbial mic and drop their definition of what justice is. And Aristotle, just like composition teachers, just like us, said, why do some kids get it and some kids don't? And one day he had a eureka moment and he said, aha, I got it. My students that orate very well have a certain computative mathematical approach to their thinking. And he called it the syllogistic method. And all it is is when you argue from premise, premise to conclusion. So if I were to say to you, Arsenic is deadly in my first premise. You'd nod your head and say, yeah, Christian, you're right. You're absolutely right. But then if I followed up with this second premise, my dog ate arsenic, we're going to conclude the following. Uh-oh, Christian, that's not going to bode well for your dog. Dog's going to die, right? As morbid of, a, of, of an example that is, that is cogent logic right there. And that's Aristotle's word. So in composition, we talk a lot about line of reasoning. I talk about cogency a lot, which is just another synonym for line of reasoning. But I want my kids to be really methodic in their um, in their line of reasoning and in their body paragraphs. So what do we do in terms of writing? 
how can we turn this into a heuristic or a template for the purposes of performing rhetorical analysis? So the first premise would be an argument, right? We have to remember this is expository writing. We are arguing. So we don't want to do a plot synopsis of the monologue, right? We don't want to retell Gloria's story. We're analyzing it, we're arguing. So we want to have an argument that contains terms, devices, techniques. That's going to take exactly three sentences. A first premise is always three sentences. On the FRQ1 of the Lang exam, the college board always says, your argument must be central. And I say that to all of my students on every essay that's expository, right? Your argument needs to stay central. So don't slip modes and get into plot analysis. We are doing rhetorical analysis from top to, top to bottom. At the fourth sentence, we're gonna begin the second premise. And this is the textual support. We kinda wanna have a teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing. And then dig this, body paragraphs have conclusions. Oftentimes, students don't do this. A body paragraph needs a conclusion. That's where the textual analysis is housed. And that's your link, your echo, your promise, all back to the prompt and the thesis. So let me show you what a first premise looks like. And I do have a very brief stem that if you're writing along with me, you're going to use this lesson plan with your students. Equip them with this stem. It's very simple. It is right from the onset comma. Students often ask, Mr. Kuhn, where do I begin? And I would say, start where Gloria begins and indicate that as such in your paper. So I think it's wise to go chronologically, right? Work top to bottom and then cross weave when necessary. So have, have a, like a, a, a logical sequence to the analysis. So you cue your reader right from the beginning that you, you're organized, right? That you're gonna have a line of reasoning. So then my students just cherry pick the terms, the devices, techniques that happen first, second, third, right? Usually the first premise multitask and students isolate two to three of the initial moves that the author makes uh, in the passage. So look at how this goes. Right from the onset, Gloria presents the thrust of the paradox. No matter how much a woman tries to be a woman, the system sets her up for failure and ridicule. So note that I think the first thing that happens there is the identification of the paradox. Look at where I go next. So you have to use the terms, the devices, the techniques. Anaphorically beginning virtually every sentence with the ubiquitous you pronoun accentuates this fact. So I'm focusing on the uh, anaphora and the conjunctions, or not the conjunctions, the pronouns, all right? So Gloria, or sorry, uh, oh sorry, to illustrate the absurdity of the conundrum, Gloria creates a juxtaposition between what it means to be a perfect woman, only to later offset these idealistic aspirations with contradictory negations. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there, and the first premise is a promise. All right. I promise you that I'm going to have an analysis of the paradox, of the pronouns, of the conjunctions, and then uh, it gets into that idealistic aspirations with contradictory negations. So the conjunctions are what negate the whole juxtaposition, right? The, the, the cross comparison. So I have to have a discussion of that. So usually what I do when I'm done with my first premise is I go textual support hunting. I try to find a quote and or a paraphrase for everything that I promised in my first premise. And that's key to line of reasoning. Keep the promise of the first premise. Whatever terms, devices, techniques you drop in that first premise, you got to, got to, got to analyze it. You have to have support and analysis for whatever promise you dropped in that first premise. It's a guaranteed way to sustain the line of reasoning. So let's move on. Second premise begins the fourth sentence and I have another stem that I use. It's one word, immediately comma. And the immediately ties back to the right from the onset. So you go back to your beginning. So the fourth sentence, I usually start quoting 
And I mentioned paradox, so I need to have like the most germane, perfectly fit quote for the paradox. Look where I go. Immediately, almost as if she's building her argument in reverse mode, Gloria matter-of-factly presents her thesis by proclaiming, it is literally impossible to be a woman. Speaking to the, co to the collective you, the Barbie icon implores women to examine the thinking that goes into the shared belief of not being enough. Society delineates the expectations for womanhood, yet the target is always moving. In no other words, Gloria questions the inane idiocy that we, women, have to always be extraordinary, but somehow we're always doing it wrong. So let me talk about this for a little bit. Whenever you quote, you got to analyze it, right? You just can't go quote dumping. So note the analysis there. But also notice the silky smooth quote transitions. There's a way to get kids to do this, and I call it the five word rule. If students place a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keep the quote small, it should sound conversational, but they may need to learn how to use brackets. Uh, usually my students, to keep it conversational, take liberties with brackets, and I think that's really skillful. So we quoted, we have to analyze. Like a naughty math equation or convoluted line of reason begging to be unpacked, the following logical proof is presented. You have to be thin, but not too thin. And you can never say you ever want to be thin. You have to say you want to be healthy, but also you have to be thin. So remember how I said in the first premise, we mentioned irony, look at this. The irony is quite manifest. Society constantly reinforces the body myth that to be beautiful, one needs to be thin. But like all other standards, this too is a futile and unrealistic goal. Further, the have-to repetition highlights the fact that these myths have become dictums. Women, in order to be women, must accept these terms of engagement. But this is only the beginning. So I'm out of space here. It goes on to the next slide. Check this out. Gloria delineates an endless litany of contradictions. She presents one side of the argument, the idealistic goal, but notes that once these terms are met, they get canceled with an immediate but clause. For example, a woman fulfilling, fulfilling society's expectations has to answer for men's bad behavior, which is insane. But if you point that out, you're accused of complaining. It's a lose-lose proposition. So you can see there, I had support and analysis for every single one of my promises in the first premise, but I just can't end there. You got to grab it all back, throw it back to the prompt, throw it back to the thesis. Usually takes two sentences. So look how this looks. And this is what Gloria wants her audience to acknowledge. It's impossible, impossible to be all things to all people. The standard set forth is not only paradoxically impossible to approximate, but it's ridiculous that women fall prey to the game and oblige the rules. And that would be a full syllogism. And I probably should have said that earlier. Kids often ask, you know, how long is a syllogism? And I contend that to have, you know, sufficient support and analysis, a syllogistic body paragraph typically is 10 to 12 sentences. Those little itty bitty four or five sentence baggers that we see in you know college board student samples, they do not cut it. They do not hack it. They're not ambitious enough, and uh, you're just you're just going nowhere with four or five sentences. So I really think tens the target. Hard cap at twelve. You know if you can uh, you know keep it under twelve, it you, you tend to keep the line of reasoning intact and um, be ambitious with your analysis. All right, we always have questions. We just finished our first body paragraph. What do you do next? And it's that simple. You bust out another syllogism. So what you're going to do is start where you left off, three sentence first premise, get your remaining terms, devices, techniques. There's so much more in that passage, in that monologue that we haven't even scratched the surface of yet. And we're still, because since we went chronologically, 
we're still above the middle of the passage. We still have the whole rest of the text to analyze. So switch up the terms, the devices, techniques, switch up the quotes, switch up the paraphrases, shoot for 10 to 12 sentences, right? First premise, three sentences. Second premise begins, fourth sentence. Use the five word rule for the quotes, tier two level vocab, sentence structures, voila, we got it. So that's how you would do the remaining paragraph. And my students just do four paragraphs on the AP exam for Lit and Lang. All, every single FRQ, my students only do four paragraphs. Intro, two bodies, conclusion. All right, let's wrap this up. We still need a conclusion paragraph. And I have my students use simple stems like the ones you see here. So I kind of equate it to going to see a 4th of July fireworks display. If you ever go to see fireworks, you're promised a grand finale. And at the end of the essay, I want the grand finale. And it's the big encapsulation of everything that you just said and presented. So kind of key words, cueing words like simply said, evidentially, in no other words, when it is all said and done, at the end of the day, really let kids uh, unload a good sort of encapsulation of everything that they've diagrammed in their essay and just puts a nice little ribbon and bow on the present at the end of the show. So uh, I have them use those stems and I tell them shoot for three or four sentences. That's all that's needed. And that, my friends, is the Barbie monologue essay. So if you have any need to reach out to me for anything, you can send me an email at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I always, you know, like it when teachers reach out. That's what we're here for. We need to help each other out. And I, you know, a lot of teachers are like, I don't know if I can reach out to this guy. It's totally cool. I don't mind. You're not bothering me. It's what we're here for. We got to help each other out. So feel free to drop me a line. Also know I'm a lead teacher for a uh, national writing project and a lead contributor for NCTE. NWP and I have teamed up to offer a slew of professional developments that we offer throughout the calendar year. If you want information on uh, those PDs, you can check out my webpage, www.teachinghowtowrite.com. In the upper left-hand tab, there's a link that says My NWP Courses. You can see my courses and every other lead teacher from N NWP uh, is on there. And note that some are free and some are for a nominal fee. And I think, you know, regardless of that, NWP does a great job of keeping things very affordable. And uh, they do offer PD credentials for uh, teachers that need it for uh, certification purposes. So that's it for me. I wish you all happy writing, happy teaching. Be well. I hope this serves you well. And I'll see you around next time.